Welcome to Northland. Good afternoon. Is this on? Yeah, great. Uh, well, good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us. We are thrilled to be convening this um, important discussion with our stakeholders. From the very beginning here at the TTC, one of the core principles was a commitment to continuous stakeholder engagement. So, sorry about that. Uh, and we have, at each one of our ministerials, we have had um, a stakeholder discussion like this one with labor, industry, uh, small businesses, startups, worker groups. I have found, and I, I'm just getting feedback here. I don't know if someone can help us out a little. Um, I have found the stakeholder discussions to be among the richest discussions that we have had. Not that I don't love listening to my <laughs> colleagues and they listening to me, but at the end of the day, the work of the TTC only matters if it improves, you know, the regulatory environment and infrastructure environment for entrepreneurs, small businesses, workers to be successful in the U.S. and in the EU. So that's why we're doing what we're doing. I will say today we are rolling out an AI roadmap, which is, is fantastic. Uh, and hopefully will help all of the businesses who are here and importantly the workers using AI responsibly. Uh, we are rolling out a talent for growth task force which is all focused on worker training and skill development and digital skill development. Uh, again, once again, want to hear from you around that. From the biggest businesses to the smallest businesses, we hear continuously about the need for more talent and to continue to train people. Today, uh, we also have been talking ex extensively about how we're going to collaborate on the CHIPS Act and the semiconductor work that we're doing, both defensively around export controls, but even more important, offensively. How does the U.S. and the EU work together to uh, <coughs> make our research and development investments? Where do we need to be investing? How do we do that collaboratively? How do we work together to support the entire supply chain, the whole ecosystem of chips? And so that's another area of discussion that we've been talking <coughs> about. Um, I want to thank our host for having us. President Pines is here. We, each of our uh, TTC ministerials so far has taken place at a university by design. Uh, by design, we were in, in Pittsburgh, we were in Paris, we're here because core to innovation and technology starts here. Starts with the R&D, the great ideas. And excited to, for you to host us. This is my second time at the Idea Factory. Both times I've been blown away. This is why we do what we do. The great ideas coming out of your universities, how do we take them and turn them into products and services uh, that create jobs and create opportunity? And how do we make sure that opportunity is equally shared? So um, we're thrilled to be here. We want each of you guys to have an opportunity um, to offer your comments, and I'll try to stimulate some discussion in the hour or so that we have together. But before we begin, I'd like to turn it over to um, my colleague and our guest, uh, Executive Vice President Vestigar, for a few comments. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Gina, and uh, with Kenya and uh, Jamaica. Uh, I think obvious, uh, good, strong deliverable that will serve everyone uh, well. Uh, the joint uh, roadmap for, for measurement and evaluation tool on standardization for AI hopefully will serve everyone well. Hopefully it, it will be used uh, very much to create sort of a transatlantic AI uh, area. Uh, the early warning uh, on uh, shortcomings in the semiconductor supply chain, um, the subsidies, transparencies uh, on semiconductors, I think also uh, very useful for enabling a level playing field. New task force on comprehensive cooperation on quantum, uh, I think also something that is uh, thought for and that can be uh, very useful. 
Uh, and the last thing that I will uh, mention is the, is the task force on, um, uh, on uh, talent. Uh, because we can have all kinds of ambitions, all kinds of strategies, if we do not have the people uh, who knows how to create, how to implement, how to secure, how to make technology serve people, we have achieved nothing. Uh, and this is also why I'm hugely grateful that we can be here today. Thank you very much uh, for hosting us. Uh, because we feel, of course, that a university as a learning institution, one of the most central institutions in a modern society, how that sort of inspires uh, exactly that approach. So been looking very much forward uh, for your input, and thank you for your engagement so far. It has been crucial in what we have achieved. Excellent. Thank you. <coughs> thank you. So our first panel uh, is entitled Advancing Development of Sustainable, Transparent, and Resilient Supply Chains. I think everyone's eyes have been open to how vulnerable our supply chains are. And now we have to do the hard work in partnership to make sure they're more resilient. So I'll turn it over to my colleague, Secretary of State Tony Blinken, to introduce this panel. Gina, thanks very much, uh, Margaret Valdis. So wonderful to have you here with, uh, with the three of us, with Catherine, uh, with Gina. And uh, I'll add very little because we're most anxious to get into this conversation and uh, to, to hear from all of you. But as, as Gina said, the, the events of the past couple of years especially have, I think, emphasized to all of us the critical importance of having resilient supply chains. And uh, we're seeing this play out in our respective economies, uh, among our respective companies, and among uh, our, our workers and virtually all of our, all of our citizens. Um, these resilient supply chains are critical to tackling virtually every global challenge we face. We've made, I think, real progress in the TTC in strengthening our cooperation, for example, on semiconductor supply chains, uh, establishing an, an early warning system uh, on semiconductor bottle, uh, bottlenecks, and promoting transparency in our uh, incentive programs. These kind of arrangements are going to help us secure more diverse and resilient supply chains uh, for semiconductors uh, for both of our industries going forward. Uh, and that in and of itself is uh, important progress. But having said that, we still have a long way to go, and we very much welcome this opportunity uh, to hear from all of our stakeholders on the challenges that um, they're facing, that we're facing, and the priorities that we should set as we're looking forward uh, to uh, building ever more resilient uh, supply chains. So let me, let me stop with that. Let me simply say, though, to, uh, to President Pines of the University of Maryland, thank you so much for having us here today. We're grateful for it. Okay, thank you, Tony. So let's turn it over to you. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to begin by calling on a few of you, ask you to make a few comments, and then we'll go from there, beginning with our host, President Pines. Thank you, Secretary Raimondo, and good afternoon, and welcome. Welcome to the University of Maryland. Um, it's a privilege and honor for me, the President of the University, to host you here in the Idea Factory. So I'm just so privileged to have both Secretary Blinken and Secretary Raimondo, Ambassador Tai, and Executive Vice President Vestager, and our own alum, yes, <laughs> our own alum, I just found this out today, Executive Vice President Dombrovskis, who had studied here in engineering, intellectual engineering, so thank you. As you see, he's wearing my turtle pin. I put it on him this morning. <laughs> I'm very proud of that, by the way. Yeah. Very proud. He was a great student. <laughs> do, you have, do you have the transcript? <laughs> <laughs> we need proof. Yeah. We're working on it. <laughs> so it's very fitting <laughs> that our university is the site for today's roundtable in the U.S. Uh, European Union Trade and Technology Council roundtable on how to advance the development of sustainable, transparent, and resilient supply chains. It's fitting because we have an internationally recognized supply chain professors teaching our students right here at the Robert H. Smith School of Business, and because academia can and should play a fundamental role in crafting the solutions we all seek for a better supply chain linkage. It's fitting because the University of Maryland has global reach and we too have been impacted by global supply chain disruptions. While we all navigate the challenges that many are experiencing from dining services teams creating new dishes when food orders do not arrive on time, to managing delays in technology that happens to our classroom upgrades, it's the impact on research and innovation that concerns us the most. That's why I'm so grateful for this important conversation to be hosted here at the University of Maryland. As a 21st century, land-grant public research institution, we take seriously our charge of improving the lives of humankind, well as maintaining the quality of life that so many have worked on so long and hard to achieve. 
The COVID-19 pandemic has laid bare how fragile that can truly be and how much work is left to be done to make sure needed goods and services are in ample and timely supply. In the midst of the pandemic, Maryland Smith School of Business and Center for Global Business produced a Maryland Business Adapts initiative that featured five Maryland-based exporting companies that used adaptive strategies and showed resilience in the pandemic. The center continues to work with small businesses today to ensure U.S. companies competitiveness into the future. This thanks to a $1 million U.S. Department of Education grant. How else can we contribute to these solutions? I'm proud to say that Professor Boyson, researchers from the University of Maryland Supply Chain Management Center and the Earth Sciences System Interdisciplinary Center produced a playbook for a climate-ready supply chain that we are going to share with each one of you after this meeting. They assessed the climate-related risk for 12,000 12, supplier sites in the U.S. and China and outlined how companies can improve their resilience to climate-related disruptions. It was published this year in the Harvard Business Review, and it is titled, How Exposed Is Your Supply Chain to Climate Risk? So here at the University of Maryland, we know we have a great responsibility in producing both the next generation of research discoveries and pre preparing the next generation of leaders. From our student makerspaces to our quantum computing laboratories in the basement of this building, our community is grappling every day with the potential of emerging technology and what it could mean for our shared future. This is a vital process to our economic health, national security, and future prosperity, and we look forward to playing a part. Thank you. Excellent. Thank Marcus. you. Marcus. Thank you, Secretary, and let me, let me thank you all for again having us. And as you said it, I mean, it's very important to have this close exchange with stakeholders at this beautiful campus. This is great, and business on both sides of the Atlantic is certainly most willing to contribute to the success of this process. And uh, you might have seen we have again published a joint statement uh, with our friends from the US Chamber. Uh, I'm a bit surprised not to see them here, uh, but, uh, but maybe next time. So, so in any case, you have the joint uh, statement. I think, and we have said this several times, but it's more true than ever. I mean, this transatlantic relationship is producing jobs on both sides of the Atlantic, and it's more important than ever, so therefore, we are really grateful for this exchange. The primary, and you alluded to this, uh, Secretary and, and, and also Vice President, the primary target must be to improve the conditions of companies on both sides of the Atlantic. So I'm thrilled to hear about this uh, roadmap for AI. We, are, we will be most happy to have a close look into it uh, and, and hopefully uh, bring it to full fruit. Of course, I also need to address the Inflation Reduction Act on which we overall totally agree with the targets. We, I think it's very important that there's a positive uh, progress in climate ambition on, on the US side, which is, which is more than acknowledged, and, and uh, I must really underline this. And it's also clear that there, this will also, if it's handled right, has the potential and will create opportunities on both sides of the Atlantic. Nevertheless, you know there's parts we are a bit concerned about, and, and this is not a secret. We are very grateful that President Biden has reacted positively to our uh, concerns, and uh, as it's always important to be concrete, uh, let, me, let me basically say what we expect. Of course, I think we expect the solution on the electric vehicles uh, to be treated as the partners as we are, and mainly three things. I think we expect uh, to have more times for our companies to comply, to be treated like we had an FTA as far as the sourcing and the, the local content requirements is concerned, so this is about critical minerals. And of course, and most importantly, to, to be treated like our friends from Mexico or, or Canada as far as the North American assembly requirement is concerned in order to make sure that we are treated as the partners we think uh, we are, but I'm, I hope that, of course, uh, this will be solved. If the working group can solve it, excellent. Otherwise, we think it should also be solved on the level of the TTC. One more point I wanted to make, because otherwise I'll get too long, is export control sanctions and export restrictions. I think this is a crucial point. We should have a close look, and I think this group has shown 
the value already when it was about coordinating our actions towards Russia. Brilliant. Um, but I think it's also critical to make sure that we have a look on what is done previously in order to make sure that we have full awareness of what is the impact on both markets. And I think this is specifically relevant when it comes to possible actions on China. On this, I'll stop here. I hope there's a chance for more in the discussion. And once again, thank you for having us. Very good. Thank you. Christine. Yes, hi. I'm Dr. Christine Custis from the Partnership on AI. And I want to thank the host institution, our esteemed government officials, colleagues, and friends. Thank you so much for having us here uh, at the table. Uh, the Partnership on AI is a nonprofit with about 105 partners working together for a future where artificial intelligence empowers humanity by contributing to a more just, equitable, and prosperous world. And so one of the many areas of research that we engage in our responsible sourcing. And the reason this is an important issue for this particular group is that we understand that AI systems, with their growing reliance on machine learning, natural language processing, and artificial intelligence, are more and more a part of the supply chain. And what we want to let you know is that these systems require clean and labeled data sets. This is a highly labor intensive uh, issue and it often requires data enrichment workers to review, classify, and otherwise manage massive amounts of data. So out of sight, out of mind is a bit of an issue here with AI systems taking the forefront and the laborers and resources, the background. And this could cause some negative consequences as far as labor and the economy is concerned. And I'll give you a quote from our head of labor and the economy, Klatya Klinova, a policy discussion that focuses solely on the what of the supply chain, the hardware, the components, and even the software, and neglects the who exacerbates that out of sight, out of mind tendency to our peril. So we just want to make sure that the people behind these systems, the people behind these supply chains and hardware and software are considered. And this is a perfect place uh, to discuss that and bring that up. Thank you again. That is such a good point. I want to get around to everyone, and then we can come back to that. OK, we'll move over to the screen and hear from Lars from NXP. Yeah, good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thanks for having me here. I'm representative of NXP Semiconductors. And for the ones of you who don't know uh, NXP, we are a truly transatlantic company. So we are a merge of the former Motorola Semiconductors, Freescale, and the former Philips Semiconductors, NXP. And um, what, uh, we have, of course, assets on, on both sides uh, uh, of the Atlantic, uh, big factories. And uh, yeah, of course, are with our hearts very closely uh, linked also to both chips acts. Um, now, looking at uh, semiconductors, we are a true mega global supply chain. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, very, very important uh, for, for all the societal benefits uh, uh, around us. I mean, a lot of the innovations are based on electronics and then enabled by software. And uh, the, the software is carried by semiconductors. So uh, that is one of the very big, very complicated uh, supply chains. And uh, what we are seeing at the moment is that this, this global supply chain uh, is, is facing deglobalization. And now, of course, the key question is how do we react to that deglobalization in a, in a clever way? Um, because one thing is clear, if the US would drive for semiconductor autarkicity, or Europe would drive for semiconductor autarkicity, that is very easily uh, in the range of a, of a, of a bill, uh, just cost-wise, uh, uh, of, of 1,800 uh, to 1,000 billion US dollars on both sides of the Atlantic. So with CHIPS acts in the range of yeah, 50, may, maximum 100 billion dollars, uh, autarkicity is unachievable. Now, but what can we do? Uh, and uh, Mrs. Raimondo, I discussed this with Don Graves also in the Netherlands on his visit in, uh, in June. Um, what we can do is uh, we can build a NATO of semiconductors, how I called it in those days. And please don't misinterpret my language here, my rusty German uh, English uh, as, a, as, a, as a, uh, the right slogan. But what I mean by that NATO of semiconductors is, of course, we can have a coalition of friendly 
territories, friendly nations, they are sharing the same values. And like in the NATO, we can uh, have our, uh, each other's back. Uh, we can help each other uh, with the technologies, with the innovations that we have in Europe for the European markets. And by the way, they are different largely from what the US has and needs for, for its lead markets. Um, so uh, if we do this in a clever way, then we, uh, we can uh, big time help each other. If we cannot manage that in a clever way, then what happens is the following. I mean, we go for deglobalization, everyone in his territory. And what happens is uh, innovation gets slowed down or it gets more expensive because I have to innovate for the US, for Europe, for Asia. Yeah? So three times the money that I prior had, uh, had spent on semiconductor innovation. And what that means is we are passing that cost, of course, on to the end customer. And if we are not careful, we have an uh, inflation acceleration act because prices are rising. So with all of that, we have to play it very, very carefully. We can, uh, but of course, for that, uh, let's say, uh, yeah, should I say hunting in packs is the, uh, the message uh, that we have to have to employ to that ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you. We will certainly follow up with you, but let's, um, last panelist here is Susan from AmCham EU. Yes, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you, Secretary Blinken, Secretary Raimondo, and all the principals from Europe there as well. Uh, just briefly, AmCham EU represents 165 over American companies, importantly committed to and invested in Europe, were affiliated to the US Chamber. I know there was a reference to the US Chamber earlier. Thank you for the invitation. I want to say TTC ministerial comes at a critical time for US relations. The global backdrop tells us now that we need each other more than ever before. I'm sure everyone in the room agrees with that. What I would like to stress initially, it is not time to focus on our differences and disagreements. We have to focus on building a strong partnership. And with that, I would flag up solidarity and trust. We see ourselves as a, a trusted policy partner and bridge builder. That's why business is absolutely committed to the TTC. I can emphasize this. And I want to say we support you all, all your effort, and do want to work with you to get results. So thank you. So I don't need to tell anyone here in the room about the degree of integration of the world economy. That's clear. You see it, otherwise you wouldn't be there. And our member companies certainly see it. Yet the recent global disruptions have absolutely highlighted the importance of this strong, of strong supply chains. But the EU and the US are very well positioned now to cooperate closely on the resilience, on this resilience and sustainability of the supply chain. So I'd just like to give you two examples of each. Firstly, on how we can achieve resilience. The diversification of supply chains is absolutely critical, but the question, of course, is how do we get there? Diversifying does not mean complete independence. It means thinking strategically with your closest partners and allies. Therefore, we believe the TTC should be used by the EU and the US to think through together their supply chains. And I want to emphasize here maybe how they encourage together the strategic investments that need to be made on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, it's absolutely true in the area of semiconductors, which have been mentioned. The EU and the US need to strive for international coordination, for example, on monitoring and the response to the future chip shortages and supply chain disruptions. Uh, absolutely critical if we're to meet the EU's announced goal of 50% of global semiconductor production being from across the Atlantic on both sides. So it's this strategic thinking that I want to stress, the strategic cooperation, which is also, of course, key in a range of other areas such as clean technologies or healthcare. Secondly, let me move to sustainability. The oh. EU and the US absolutely share the same values, which include the respect for human dignity and the willingness to protect our environment. So the TTC, we believe, should be a platform for both sides to advance their due diligence agenda. Uh, they should exchange their ideas, best practices and intentions openly with regards to any upcoming legislation on, legislation on supply chain due diligence, including forced labour. In addition, they should strive to align as much as possible with global standards. So, so to close, finally, taking action on this resilience and sustainability supply chains will only be possible if the, e, if the EU and the US work together as allies. Cooperation is absolutely critical. It may just seem obvious in this room today, but I think we cannot emphasize this enough. We would caution against unilateral strategies and protectionist measures, which would harm EUS cooperation. 
and not help either side deliver on their common objectives. Uh, yes, we have heard a lot of talk over the last few days and the last week or so about he, how each side can achieve their objectives, but we believe we also need to talk about how we can achieve these objectives together, which is exactly what the TTC should continue to be about. Uh, we stand ready, I'm Chami Yu, Sounds ready to contribute. I know I can see uh, EVP Vistaga there. It was a pleasure to be with you just uh, last week, uh, EVP. And um, uh, we stand ready to contribute to support and keep up the momentum, not let other things take precedence here. We need to keep up the momentum. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Okay. We've got, you know, maybe another 10 minutes or so for this first panel for discussion. So I'd like to offer the opportunity for any of my co-chairs to ask a question or make a comment. Uh, yeah, uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you very much, um, uh, dear colleagues, for uh, participating in this uh, stakeholders' events and for your uh, uh, inputs and uh, uh, perspectives. Well, as we see, uh, supply chains uh, are a complex um, uh, uh, phenomena and uh, global uh, events or policy decisions in different uh, places of the world can uh, have unexpected uh, uh, impacts. At the same time, our economic prosperity has been built on global openness and on well-functioning transatlantic uh, uh, trade, which is key for resilient supply uh, uh, change. So, um, yeah, therefore, uh, uh, um, your knowledge as um, uh, uh, policy makers and experts uh, helps uh, the TTC uh, to find a joint solutions addressing vulnerabilities in a strategic uh, uh, supply chains. Uh, so uh, this is um, uh, also, for example, one of the objectives uh, of uh, today's uh, transatlantic initiative on sustainable trade, which we launched uh, uh, today, exactly to ensure resilience of uh, critical supply chains uh, for the green transition of economy. Would it be solar? Would it be um, uh, 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 electromobility, battery uh, uh, co components, um, uh, and uh, more broadly, I think it's very important that we do so in a way that it's mutually uh, supporting as an uh, allies. So the question I wanted to ask to the uh, participant is which additional uh, elements in this sustainability area, uh, beyond the ones that I mentioned, you uh, could uh, consider uh, for uh, for expanding. So what would be other areas on uh, on the green transition supply chains you would highlight as uh, very important? Thank you. Can I, can I ask one more thing? Please. Um, I don't know if you have had time to familiarize yourself, but we have agreed today on a transparency uh, mechanism uh, when it comes to public support in the field of semiconductors. And um, in general, uh, would you find that kind of output beneficial also in other areas? We have different systems. We have our state aid system. The U.S. have a different system. But that to push for transparency when it comes to subsidies in more areas, is that something that would be useful? Go ahead, please. I'll say uh, to the first question, and I think it relates to your question as well, uh, one of the things that we look at at the Partnership on AI is uh, the idea that documentation can be a really powerful and simple tool to action transparency and to action responsible AI. So thinking about ways to use documentation throughout the entire life cycle, not just for the end, right before deployment, but in thinking about the business case and whether or not AI is necessary, thinking about the marginalized communities that might be impacted by the work, thinking about all the actors and uh, stakeholders and through development, your engineering team, your PR teams, just thinking all the way through the life cycle, ways that documentation can support that transparency and can, and can support uh, the actioning of that ethical uh, development of, of any of the tools that you would uh, put into production. Lars or Susan, would you like to weigh in on this, or Lars, particularly on the question as it relates to the subsidies and semiconductors? Yeah, a, a big thanks. No, uh, I mean, that absolutely helps. Uh, uh, as I said prior uh, in my pitch, uh, I mean, if the goal uh, would be to have a uh, territory uh, that, that uh, in, in, in this territory uh, uh, be a certain, uh, let's say, aligned ecosystem, 
uh, then of course exactly that transparency is key because otherwise uh, we are only busy, busy with ourselves uh, uh, trying to avoid subsidy races uh, or, or uh, let's say skews in that uh, in that ecosystem uh, itself. So from that angle, if you're looking from that high flight level uh, to the activity, uh, absolutely yes. Um, I think what is also important is, uh, and, and let me take a picture of the of the member states of the European Union. Uh, there is, of course, very big member states that have semiconductor ecosystems. I stay with my semiconductor example. Um, if these uh, member states uh, go ahead, uh, move the semiconductor ecosystem in their territory forward, it will also be the other member states that are benefiting. The same is in the US. I mean, you have local hotspots uh, for, for, for semiconductor manufacturing. Look at uh, Austin, for example, but also the, the entire environment, uh, all the other uh, states of the uh, of the union will benefit uh, because uh, if we cannot supply the semiconductors, then the GMs, the Fords, the Siemenses, and the Schneiders of this world they cannot build their devices anymore, and they are sitting in the in the other parts of the uh, uh, of the uh, of the continents. So from that angle, uh, alignment. Transparency absolutely a key goal, and, and as I said, yeah, in, in, in my words, I would uh, I would I would club it together uh, under the slogan "Hunting in packs" and, and doing everything for that to have a a, a well aligned playing field. Yeah. Thank you, Catherine or Tony. Do you have any questions? Well, um, first, I'd just like to say um, this is such an important conversation. I'm glad that we're having it. <laughs> we build on it every time we do a convening like this. Um, and uh, what we really have before us is an incredible opportunity. Obviously, it is an opportunity that is coming out of um, tremendous hardship, especially over these last couple years. Uh, but there are so many lessons that we have to learn. Um, how can we become more resilient? Um, and uh, you know, the definition of sustainability, um, Susan, to your point, it does you know draw our focus to our people and to our overall environment. Um, that sustainability also means a, you know, a global economic system of trade and uh, decision making, um, supply chains and um, a, um, a worker connectivity um, that is going to be durable and last a long time. So it is a tremendous opportunity. I, th I completely agree with all of you that uh, between the uh, United States and the EU and our stakeholders, um, that there is a tremendous amount of wisdom, uh, experience, and innovation that we can bring. And um, uh, Christine, I also wanted to um, uh, reference your comments in terms of when we think about AI, it, it is actually a very abstract concept. Um, you know, maybe um, uh, numbers and code, something that is going to organize and order already is um, uh, the way things are done in our world, um, really focusing on the fact that um, AI is a product of human ingenuity, and AI is there, and it can be either a source of pain, or it can be part of the solution for, and to you, President Pines, um, advancing the experience of humankind, I think is tremendously inspiring. I just want to thank all of you, um, and um, really encourage us to uh, focus on these elements um, of uh, a new set of systems uh, that we can bring to a new version of globalization that is built not just for efficiency, efficiency is still important, but uh, for resilience and durability as well. I really just want to see if anyone has any reactions to any of the, other, the comments that have been made in, in any of these areas, because unfortunately we have a short amount of time and uh, a richness of uh, views and insights already that have been presented, but I'm just curious to see the uh, any reactions to what you're talking about? Marcus. And oh. oh, Susan and then Marcus. Yeah, so, yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, no, just to react quickly to the two questions <laughs> from uh, Ivi Dombrovskis, one, um, <clears throat> and EVP Vestaga. Transparency, yes, I believe, EVP, yes, indeed. I mean, we, I haven't had the chance to look at that, what you've announced today, but I'm sure transparency in other areas will be very well received. I think it's just something that business will always um, uh, strive for. Uh, and then perhaps to your question, EVP Dombrovskis, with regard to sustainable trade, maybe just a couple of a couple of examples just to throw out of where we think uh, progress could be made. Circular economy is one, for example, with regard to clean technologies. I think there's a lot of cooperation that could, a lot of work that could be done in that area with regard to common agreements on recycling, waste management, 
common approaches to initiatives in that regard, uh, plastic requirements and so forth. And the other one I want to mention, just an example maybe to, to, to leave with you today is in the area of healthcare. I think that is a sort of not necessarily low hanging fruit, but I think pr um, uh, progress in healthcare with regard to mutually uh, recognized agreements is something we should really um, work towards, whether it's in on inspections. I mean, we've seen uh, what we were able to do with regard to vaccines. So if we can make even more progress with MRAs, I think we would um, uh, really have something uh, a deliverable and a success story there. So I'll leave it, leave it there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. We had a discussion about healthcare this morning, Susan, and I think we agree with you. There's more opportunity there for collaboration. We'll give you the last word on this panel. Thank you, thank you, Secretary. I mean, first let me uh, let me underline. I fully agree with we must avoid the subsidy race. So therefore, transparency is key, and very very glad to hear that uh, there was there was real progress here. And I can I can echo what Susan said. I had the same on my list. I think the MRAs this is key. Uh, on things we have had in the last crisis, on vaccine, for instance, but also on the green. I mean, the, going back to electric vehicles, I mean, if we are able to set the standards for electric vehicles in the world or for charging stations, I mean, I think we will, we will be able to set the gold standard in the world, and, and I think this is what we should aim for. Yeah, excellent point. Okay, as Tony said, we wish we had more time, but we have to keep us moving here. So the next panel is entitled Cooperating on Digital Policy and Tech Standards, which is a perfect segue. In fact, we just talked about tech standards and aligning. So before we begin with the panelists, I'd like to give Margrethe a few minutes to set the table for this discussion. Well, thank you very much. Um, and again, also welcome to, to this part of the discussion. Um, because the panel would touch upon some of the essential uh, benefits of the Trade and Technology Council, uh, which is to create a, a sort of a transatlantic space for digital, but also for emerging uh, technologies. Uh, because before uh, uh, we've been left behind in, in the standard setting, we should not let that uh, happen again. And um, well, for obvious reasons we're different, we have different legis legislative procedures, we cannot uh, develop a common sort of legislative or regulatory framework. That is not within reach. But we can seek for convergence mm -hmm. in how things are uh, implemented. Uh, and also, I think, with our discussions, providing some guidance uh, and advance sort of a more collaborative uh, approach uh, to standardization organizations and bodies. I think that is absolutely essential. I think the success of uh, working together on promoting uh, the leadership of the International Telecommunications Union, uh, I think Doreen is such a magnificent uh, choice as a, as a leader, and as you know, it's a European uh, <coughs> who has the, the role as, as deputy. I think that is just showing the way, because sometimes people say, oh, but that's just, isn't that a detail? No, 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 people matter. It matters who's there, who sets the agenda, who calls the shots, who pushes uh, things forward. So I'm really happy uh, with this. And I think the work that we have done on artificial intelligence should be seen as seeking common ground where there are mutual uh, benefits, uh, regardless uh, of the fact that we have uh, different uh, legislation, we have different timing, but we have the same approach. Focus on use cases, don't regulate technology, but focus on use cases where there is a risk of uh, human rights or, or the integrity of the, uh, the individual. Um, I think the same can be true for um, other emerging uh, technologies uh, where cooperation are on track. That goes for e-mobility, digital identity, cybersecurity of the Internet of Things, post-quantum encryption. I think there's quite a lot of things. You'll see them in the statement where would we uh, could uh, push forward. Um, and then I did not even mention the importance of collaborating on the technologies that comes beyond. Uh, so uh, 60, uh, obviously, quantum, uh, that we see what can we do uh, together here. So looking forward uh, to see uh, what you see ahead of us, uh, not only sort of here and now, but also what we can do here and now in order to prepare for the future. Because we do a lot of crisis management right now. Uh, there is a war in Europe. Uh, there is a raging uh, energy crisis. Uh, weapon has been, winter has been weaponized. 
Um, so every step we take in urgency, we keep an eye on the future because every step of urgency gives you the direction as to where you will end up sometime. So, so looking very much forward uh, for this debate, I think it's, it's absolutely crucial, not only for business, but also for who we are and, and how we actually represent ourselves. So, so thank you very much for, for participating. Excellent, thank you. Melissa, we'll give you the first word. Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me here today. Nokia is an ardent supporter of the TTC and recognizes its strategic importance. We applaud both the EU and the US for promoting digital infrastructure as a strategic asset for Western competitiveness. As trusted partners, which we've all agreed here, the EU and the US, there's some backdrop there, um, should keep their markets open to each other and strengthen their commercial ties. And tech regulations and policies should be aligned, reflecting common values while supporting transatlantic competitiveness. The EU and the US should help spread the benefits of sustainable, trusted, and value-based digitalization efforts around the world, like the two initiatives you just mentioned in Jamaica and, and Kenya. And also, as you referenced, uh, global standards. Global standards underpin global connectivity, and we ask the EU and the US for a renewed commitment to a global, industry-led, voluntary, and consensus-based process. We hope that a new mechanism to coordinate engagements in international standardization will produce meaningful results, and as an industry, we offer our full support. In conclusion, by acting together, the EU and the US have the potential to enshrine common democratic values as guiding principles for digital transformation, positively impacting the entire world. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Victoria. Thank you. Uh, Secretary Blinken. Secretary Raimondo, Ambassador Tai, Executive President Vestager, Executive Vice President and University of Maryland alum, DeBrodis, <laughs> and President Pines, thank you very much for having us here today. Uh, my name is Victoria Espinel. I am the CEO of the BSA Software Alliance. We represent the enterprise software industry around the world, including enterprise software companies that are headquartered in both the United States and in the EU. I also lead the Global Data Alliance, which is a cross-industry coalition that brings together 15 different industry sectors to work on trusted cross-border data transfers. Um, and lastly, I have the great honor to serve on the NIAC, the US National AI Artificial Intelligence Advisory Committee, where I chair the Working Group on Trustworthy Artificial Intelligence. Um, Thank you very much for having all of us here today. I want to thank you not just for the work done in the TTC, but also the very open spirit of the dialogue in the TTC. Um, the TTC is a very valuable forum for cooperation. There are three examples that I'd like to highlight um, briefly today. First, BSA strongly supports the joint roadmap on artificial intelligence um, and the shared commitment to a risk-based approach to ensure trustworthy AI systems. <coughs> this is very important work to carry forward and BSA looks forward to working with a broad range of stakeholders around the world to ensure that we focus on guidelines to assess and mitigate potential harms from high risk uses of artificial intelligence. Two years ago, um, BSA created an impact assessment model to mitigate the risk of bias in artificial intelligence. Thank you very much to Executive Vice President Vestager and Secretary Raimondo for participating in the launch of the BSA framework to confront bias in artificial intelligence. And since that time, we have been working very actively with policymakers, but also a range of stakeholders to try to address this issue. Um, so thank you very much for that, um, for the work the TTC is doing on this. Second, uh, enterprise software companies welcome your work on standards development that enables park market competition and helps to preclude trade barriers. Our government should continue to pursue open, non-discriminatory international standard development in all areas, including the areas of emerging technology that you're already highlighting. So in areas including cybersecurity, but also looking at AI, quantum, and the emerging technologies of the future. 
Finally, I want to know that BSA is very concerned about the cloud certification rules that have been proposed in the EU, known as the EUCS, that purport to advance cybersecurity, but we believe would actually harm security for companies that are going through digital transformation. These draft rules would enable member states to introduce data localization mandates and ownership restrictions that do not improve cybersecurity, and we believe they would undermine our laudable and shared transatlantic goals. So I would encourage the EU and the U.S. to work together to raise levels of cybersecurity and to permit organizations of all sizes in any sector to select the technology providers that best meet their needs and provide the highest level of cybersecurity protection. This could be an area for fruitful discussion in the TTC. Um, sorry, I put that out there as a suggestion. But more broadly, um, I would echo Executive Vice President Vestager's thought that part of the genius of this group is the ability not just to be working on the issues that confront us in the moment, but also to be looking to the forward into the future and how to build that path. Thank you very much. Thank you, Victoria. Two quick comments. One, we did talk about the cyber certification issue this morning, and I think you're right. TTC could be a, a good place to look to resolve that issue. Secondly, um, once you have had an opportunity to look at the AI roadmap, and I would say this to all of you, uh, help us to disseminate it to your various memberships, because we talked this morning, it's only useful insofar as it's used. And an enormous amount of work has gone into it. It is exact. It's what we're talking about, right? We spent, I don't know, months at the table, aligning U.S. EU approach to responsible use of AI. Uh, we're very proud of that work. But whether it's AmCham or BSA, all of you push it out so that it gets used and disseminated. Um, Cam, I'm, thank you very much. I'm. I co-lead at the Brookings Institution uh, alongside uh, at the Center for European Policy Studies in Brussels, a forum on cooperation on AI, which is trying to address many of the issues that you are discussing in, in the TTC. I am, and you know, with that in mind, I see the, the, the roadmap as a very constructive step that uh, really puts into practice many of the recommendations that we made for uh, for regulatory alignment, uh, for standards development, um, and for joint R&D uh, a year ago. Um, and you know, does you know the 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 premise of those discussions is, as you said, Vice President Bestier, that that. You know, we, with different legal systems uh, and different approaches to law and regulation, uh, we will not get to the same place on the books, but we can do the so, same things on the ground, and that is precisely what I see uh, the AI roadmap doing. Uh, I want to focus uh, particularly on what it does about standards, and I was going to talk about the global importance of standards development, uh, but I think the the roadmap clearly recognizes that, and we've heard that as, as a theme today. And both the EU and the, the U.S. have a commitment to, to bottoms-up uh, standards development uh, through uh, participatory um, and non-governmental standards development organizations. Um, uh, and you know, that's, uh, that's reaffirmed, but I do see you know, that there is a need um, uh, to, to refresh some of the policies on standards development. I think the EU has done that, uh, has begun that process with its policy uh, in February of this year on standards uh, development to, uh, to take a strategic approach uh, to engage. But I do see some tensions between that and uh, the, uh, you know, the 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 bottoms-up approach uh, to to standards. I am, uh, you know, there are EU uh, harmonized standards, standards that are specified by the Commission uh, for adoption by Sencenelec or by Etsy. I am, and you know, we recognize that these play a necessary role in the single market, but when it comes to 
global technology and global issues, I think there needs to be some de delineation. And the starting point there should be <coughs> international standards as, as we've heard in preserving uh, the integrity of global standards development. Uh, the standards, uh, the proposed standards regulation would uh, is intended specifically to reduce the role of actors uh, from outside the EU or the uh, European Economic Area uh, and, and put those, the decision making entirely within national standardization bodies. That would apply to, for example, the AI Act, uh, uh, which you know, as proposed calls for uh, harmonized EU standards. I'm, I'm encouraged that the European Parliament seems to be taking things in a different direction toward uh, you know, tying conformity assessments to, to ISO standards. So I think the, that raises, I think in the, the EU standards policy raises important issues for additional voices in the standards development process, for making the processes um, you know, more transparent. Uh, and I think those are things that you know, need some refresh uh, on uh, the U.S. side. Uh, the uh, White House policy in 2012 uh, uh, you know, allows for active in government engagement uh, uh, to accelerate standards development implementation using convening uh, powers uh, uh, to, to uh, help in standards development. So some points uh, on where I think the TTC can advance uh, these efforts. I understand from a conversation with, with DG Connect uh, recently that the commission is mapping uh, standards for conformity assessments, see what is in international standards and you know, what might be left for Sensenelec. That's an exercise that could be happening in, uh, you know, within uh, the, the working group uh, uh, so that the U.S. and EU um, you know, can jointly explore priorities for development and for engagement uh, and for convening on standards. Convening is a key role uh, for governments in the standards model. Um, uh, and the U.S. and EU, as part of this process, uh, should be exploring priorities for standards development so that you know, each can engage with, with their stakeholders. Um, uh, and, you know, and, and lastly, I would say that this discussion should, should explore mechanisms to make standards development more inclusive uh, um, and more accessible um, and pursue joint efforts to increase participation from less developed countries uh, and a broader spectrum of participants within uh, our own economies. Yeah. yeah, we certainly agree with that. Thank you. Uh, okay, over to Sen Senelec. Elena, we'll turn to you on the screen. Yes, and good afternoon and good evening for my colleagues that are here in Europe. Uh, maybe I should start by an anecdote. Uh, tonight, uh, San Nicolas is coming to Brussels. Uh, it's a saint that brings um, present to kids uh, from Spain, I'm Spanish, into Brussels. So I'm really, I think that my San Nicolas is bringing me a possibility to present uh, the sensitive activities uh, to, the, to the TDC because uh, uh, it's not uh, something that happens very often. So I would like to take this, uh, this opportunity. So thank you very much uh, to all of you and all those that are attending online. Um, in these moments of uh, pessimism about uh, global economy, and we heard uh, a lot in the previous panel to geopolitical instability, conflict, inflation, volatile energy prices, supply chain disruptions. Uh, it is really vital to look into those tools and assets uh, that can turn challenges into opportunities. Huh? And the standards can do that. Huh? I mean, Sen and Senelec are the European standards organizations. Uh, maybe it's important also to highlight that uh, we don't develop uh, European standards as a first uh, uh, approach. Uh, 
we always uh, try to go for the international standard. And to do that, uh, we have got very strong agreements with ISO and with IEC. I can say that 82% of the standard standards are identical to the international standards developed in IEC with all uh, countries of many countries all over the world. And the same happens with, uh, with CEN and ISO. So our first approach is always to look into what is happening at international level or so we make a proposal to develop a standard at international level, even for standards that are supporting European policies and legislation. So there is no as such uh, uh, initiatives to develop uh, European standards for the sake of it. Huh? Of course, it is very, very important uh, that uh, we take into account uh, the needs uh, for the single market uh, and that uh, we put uh, together all the different elements that characterized uh, the standards development. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, standards supported the establishment of uh, alternative production lines for protective equipment and devices, um, increasing safety of uh, professionals, of citizens, uh, and mitigating supply chain disruptions. And I think that uh, we all have experience uh, on that. Uh, we are currently activating economic actors uh, engagement in climate mitigation and the energy challenge uh, where digital policies and technology play a major role. So there are a lot of standards that are under development. And as I said before, many of them we developed at international level and then we adopt them at European level. Maybe the difference is that uh, what we do in Europe is that once a standard is approved, uh, we adopt the standard identical in all the countries that are members of CEN and CEMELEC, which are the countries that, that are members of the, of the single market, supporting the single market. So one of the greatest values in the standards is obtained from the making of the standard. And we have heard a lot today about inclusiveness. And we need to take into account that it's very important to have SMEs engage in the standards making process. This is something that in any case, in, in, in our uh, um, example, we do through the national standards bodies that are very close to SMEs that speak their own language and that are able to engage and bring their interest into the global standards making or to the European standards making when there is a need. The standards need to be voluntary. I fully hear what has been said and need to be market driven. But they, they need to be framed, or at least the standards that uh, we believe uh, should be named as standards, uh, they need to be framed by shared values, like those that are shared by the EU and the US, uh, and by a robust and well-functioning public-private partnership. This is the only way to create that, uh, an inclusive, voluntary, market-driven process framed by values and framed by a public-private partnership that works. And that is the, mess, the best way to create competition, disseminate innovation, and accelerate the implementation of public policies and legislation. And I think this is the approach that uh, we try to follow in Europe. This is what we call the, the, the European model. And we are happy to uh, collaborate and uh, try to find uh, convergence and, and venues of cooperation with uh, with our US uh, uh, counterparts. Uh, we are currently working, as I'm sure that uh, US is also actively working on standards for cutting edge and digital technologies, uh, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, blockchain, quantum, FinTech, uh, e-accessibility. And um, as I said, building on whatever possible initiatives taken at global level by the international standards bodies, ISO and IC, that also follow the national delegation principle that ensure inclusiveness in the standards making process and transparency in the standards development process. So we believe that standards can contribute to an inclusive digital society and build a shared ecosystem of trust. Now, it has been also mentioned before, the US and US standards makers have a significant, and in many ways, different starting points, different outlooks, different levels of complexity. I mean, we in San and Lake, we need with, uh, in the case of uh, my membership, 34 members, 34 national standards bodies working together, and we need to agree on 
what and on technical harmonization for the single market. So it's the EA and the applicant countries uh, to the union. No? And uh, we are convinced that it is possible to align standards approaches and content, uh, and we are committed to do that. Huh? But we also would like to invite you not to underestimate the challenge. It is very important uh, that uh, our reference networks, uh, policy and stakeholders uh, are compatible and are indeed convergent. Uh, timely matters, uh, I mean, to deliver a standard on a time or another will really make a difference uh, for the market. Um, and making the utmost of our cooperation requires uh, joint anticipation and a very, very huge stakeholder engagement effort. Standards are not just, uh, okay, here is a standard. We really need expertise that, are in, that is engaged, that is willing to contribute. Uh, I always say that the standards experts are very generous because you share your know-how, but you don't know what is going to come out of the consensus making process in the standards making. So to be able to enjoy the social, trade, economic benefits of, of the standards cooperation, a stakeholders engagement, uh, together with a common understanding of what are the objectives that we are trying to achieve is really crucial. And we would like to invite uh, all of you that are really determining the, the objectives of the, of the PPC and putting that into actionable objectives, which we really appreciate uh, to, to take into account that we should not underestimate the effort that we need to invest uh, in getting experts working together. And experts not only from big companies, experts from SMEs, experts from consumers organizations, for environmental organizations, for trade organizations, so that uh, we have got wider participation and wide market acceptance in Europe and the US. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll underscore the point about SMEs. And the burden is on us to make sure that happens. SMEs are busy, they're short staffed. They don't necessarily always get invited to these efforts and or have the time, but it's essential to stimulate innovation that we make sure we have SMEs at the table. Okay, we are running out of time here, and I want to give the last word to Monique to give us the very important perspective of the consumer uh, in all of this. Yes, uh, thank you very much, and thank you for giving me the floor. I would just uh, follow, like to follow up on Elena's anecdote with Saint Nicola, saying that from the consumer perspective, Saint Nicola is like dark patterns before the digital era, uh, because you don't. So, uh, so we would not ask the TTC to solve the Saint Nicola dark pattern, but we would like to encourage you to work together on how to protect people against dark patterns. Just a proposal. I couldn't resist following up of uh, on Elena. Now, more seriously, what I would like to say is um, I would, in the context of the AI roadmap, I would like to bring uh, an issue to your attention uh, because you have not been able to provide input into the previous, uh, let's say, uh, versions of the, of the roadmap. So I would like to take this opportunity. Uh, you know that the AI Act is being currently discussed uh, between EU institutions and many important elements of AI, such as the definition of bias or the definition of risk, will be uh, left to uh, implementing measures and through a technical standard. Uh, and this is, of course, something um, that is for us, uh, those are crucial concepts for us. And uh, we know that uh, TTC would also uh, plan to work on, uh, on, on the same issues under the AI uh, roadmap. Now, if these concepts are being defined between the EU and the US before they are going to be defined in the EU, we believe that we have a problem there because we, we believe that this definitions need to be taken domestically by the European legislator. Uh, and any, let's say, um, cooperation on the trade side, if I can say so, uh, which should be avoided because uh, we believe that that needs democratic scrutiny at uh, European level. And this is not just a technical definition. And uh, if, if the definition, for example, of bias is um, not correct, not, not defined carefully, we will have this um, this concept, like uh, Ambassador Tai mentioned, AI will then become a source of pain, but not only of pain, but it will become a source of discrimination. Uh, people will not uh, receive the credit that they would deserve. They will not receive the work that they be offered the job that they deserve. They would not uh, receive the healthcare that they deserve. 
So we believe that it is really very important that uh, those concepts are being um, based on, uh, let's say, the legislative and the, the, the democratic consensus within each jurisdiction. This being said, we believe that the TTC, TTC has a major role to play in protecting people, consumers and citizens uh, against, uh, let's say, the downsides of, the, of AI. For example, we would be, find it really very interesting if you could find common solutions uh, to end commercial surveillance or if you could work to protect, as I said in the beginning, with a smile, but still seriously too, uh, protect people against um, dark patterns. Finally, because I know time is short, so I don't want to, uh, to keep you longer, um, because it was also mentioned that transparency is important and input from all stakeholders. So we would really uh, like to encourage uh, TTC uh, to make this uh, process even more open than, than, than it is now. And I think it was Christine who mentioned documentation. And we believe that one major step to also enhance the knowledge of TTC and the work of TTC would be to create a common website that would be open to everybody, where you could uh, um, publish the agendas of the, of the working groups, where you could uh, publish the documents that are uh, available so that all stakeholders could have an input. And then we are happy, really happy. We, are, we have a reputation, I think, in Europe uh, to provide constructive input into decision making. And if we have the possibility to contribute, it's, it's something that can also help the process to be, uh, let's say, taking into account con consumers and citizens' uh, input uh, as from the start. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah thank you. Those are excellent comments. Uh, okay, miraculously, we even have a few minutes for discussion here. Um, any of our European guests? Yes? Oh, conclu okay, does anyone have anything to ask? Go ahead. Thank you. Well, very briefly on, s on standards to echo a couple of the things Melissa, Cameron, and Elena have said. I mean, uh, and to underline the essential. I think, I think international standards and European standards are absolutely this key for what we're doing here. So therefore, of course, they need to be industry-driven, and I think Melissa raised it, and market-relevant. And, and this means we need to keep the companies engaged and interested in the process because it's a hell of an investment to invest in the experts you send to these things. So industry driven, market relevant. At the same time, uh, and on this I agree with Cameron, uh, of course in our European standards we need to be open to companies which are not European headquartered because otherwise, I mean, we, we lack the expertise. There is some strategic issues to be kept in mind. I mean, I give this to politics, but I think we need to be open on all sides to to really have all the knowledge at the table. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Can I just uh, challenge you on, on, on one thing? Uh, because you, are, you have already asked, answered my question about should we do more when it comes to standardization? And I think that's a real something. Yes, 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 please do. Uh, and especially when it comes to involving SMEs. But second, um, could we make a stakeholder event on our sort of AI roadmap uh, before the next TTC? to give you an incentive actually to dive in, uh, to see what it is, to see what will be useful, to get in touch with people who will really need this uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, and then pick it up in two months, uh, something like that, uh, in order to see is, is this useful? What will it take to take it, now it's done, from the shelf uh, into real life? Uh, and then have another stakeholder event to see how is this working? Is this, is this what we thought of it to be or, or should it be something else? Because, you know, we think that we have created something hmm, quite good and, uh, <laughs> uh, and we would want to use it as a template. And if that is crazy, of course, we need to know that quite soon. Strong yeah, yes from BSA. I mean, we're going to dive in regardless. So strong yes right. from us. Um, and uh, let me just underscore, I think, the critical importance of the United States and Europe working together on this. The definitions that we talked, that were referred to, it's critically important those be defined in a way where consumers, but also workers and underrepresented communities in general are seeing the benefits of AI. And I, I have... I have confidence that all of our governments are focused on that, but I think working on it together makes it even more powerful. So I would just underscore that message. Okay, I think it's an excellent idea, and we should plan that. I also uh, think we should take up Monique's suggestion around putting the agendas online. Mm -hmm. I think that is very smart. I think we all have more we want to say, but the clock says we cannot do that. So I'd like to ask Ambassador Tai 
and EVP Dombrowskis to close us out. And thank you so much to all of you who participated. Well, what a wonderful opportunity for convening everyone um, and continuing to build on uh, this incredibly uh, rich um, uh, relationship between the United States and the EU, uh, our two economies, um, and aligning ourselves for uh, meeting the challenges and taking advantages of the opportunities of the future and, and, and setting the pace and the standard really for uh, the rest of the world. I wanna underscore uh, how um, tremendously inspired I am uh, by um, seeing all of us around the table. First, to have us here in person uh, and be able to reconnect with old friends, uh, to make new friends, uh, to create that synergy and buzz uh, when you put people in a room and have them start talking to each other. The other is to um, uh, share with all of you that um, the tone and spirit of the conversation that you've observed here um, is very much replicated, if, if not you know, enhanced, uh, in the work that we are doing on the government-to-government, team-to-team basis. This is an incredibly solution-oriented forum. And I think that that is really important and appropriate given um, uh, what we uh, are all facing in terms of challenges, uh, but also opportunities. So whether it's with respect to um, our supply chains, um, you know, remaking the global economy uh, so that it serves us better, so that there's more elasticity and give for um, the shocks that we know will come from wherever they're going to come from as we move forward into the future, uh, or with respect to um, getting a hold of, taking the reins of the digital transformation and ensuring that this is something uh, that serves our societies uh, and our economies well. Um, I think that uh, we continue to build on a tremendously successful platform and uh, want to invite my good friend and colleague, uh, Valdis, um, to also offer uh, his thoughts here in the <laughs> concluding part of this stakeholder event. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Katrin. Um, uh, uh, thank you, uh, colleagues, so dear uh, speakers, uh, uh, dear online uh, participants. Well, first of all, uh, thank you for this uh, encouraging and inspiring uh, discussion. Uh, our discussion and also interest from online viewers uh, uh, proves that uh, TTC continues to uh, uh, attract lots of uh, attention. Uh, many of uh, you are investing your time in providing us with uh, feedback and let me underline that your views, comments and inputs are crucial for the daily work of the TTC. Uh, they help us to focus uh, the mind and ensure that the transatlantic space is often safe and uh, prosperous. Uh, in our discussions uh, this uh, morning, we uh, reflected on the work uh, done uh, this year and how we achieved to pursue our agenda from uh, Pittsburgh to Paris, now to uh, uh, here in Maryland. And uh, on a balance, we are uh, confident that we are delivering uh, important uh, outcomes. Uh, we executed a firm uh, response uh, as regards uh, uh, Russia's aggression against uh, Ukraine, uh, launched uh, uh, strategic uh, standardization information to promote uh, common interests on standardization, uh, issued a joint roadmap on trustworthy AI, and <coughs> also expanding cooperation in emerging te uh, the technologies such as uh, quantum, very much subjects also of our uh, today's uh, uh, discussion. Uh, promote secure and resilient digital uh, community uh, connectivity in uh, partner uh, countries. Uh, today we launched our trade and labor uh, dialogue to further uh, have a voice of uh, uh, social uh, partners, uh, defined a sustainability agenda in trade, which will now be reinforced with transatlantic initiative on sustainable trade, and uh, focused on uh, creating new opportunities for transatlantic trade and investment through uh, uh, digital uh, tools to facilitate trade and uh, reduce uh, red tape, uh, mutual recognition, uh, conformity assessment, and other uh, uh, work streams. Uh, uh, at the same time, we are heading towards yet another challenging year that will be marked with geopolitical rivalry and economic uncertainty. So we need to stay united and work together to uh, deliver our shared ambitions and our goals. So the uh, last thing uh, uh, we should uh, do is creating unnecessary distractions or potential new uh, disputes. That's why it's very important that we address <coughs> the challenges posed by Inflation Reduction Act uh, properly. Uh, I'm encouraged by the discussion uh, uh, today and uh, uh, your support that we all uh, share this uh, goal and how the TDC leading these uh, uh, efforts. 
So uh, thank you very much, and we look forward for our continued conversations in 2023. Fantastic yes. summary. Thank you, and thank you all.